Hey, what's going on, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy, jumping on real quick to introduce a new podcast episode to you. I'm excited to share this one with you. Uh, I bring on a guest, Mark Graben, and he is fantastic. He's a public speaker. He's uh, done tons of presentations. He's an author. Uh, he's a graduate of MIT uh, in mechanical engineering and also got an MBA there. Worked for uh, a vast amount of awesome companies, including Dell and General Motors and Honeywell. Uh, he really is in uh, a field of study that helps people improve their processes, the lean method. But we connected because he has created a podcast called My Favorite Mistake. And I thought it would be really fun to have him on and talk about this, what his favorite mistake has been, uh, my mistakes that I've made, and really how you can turn your mistakes into successes in your future. So we detail a lot about that in this episode, talk about his background, how this podcast was made, and also some of the resources and books that he has written himself. So he has a vast amount of experience. He's working independently now, uh, uh, has his own company, uh, teaching people these lean methods to improve their processes and their workplace, and uh, just a vast amount of information that he has. So uh, Mark Graben is awesome. You can search him on YouTube. You can go find his podcast. You can go read up on his books. We talk a lot about those things in this episode. I think you're really going to enjoy it because we all make mistakes and we can learn from them. And, uh, you know, we don't want to beat ourselves up over making mistakes and so we talk about these things and how we can improve. Anyway, I'm excited to have Mark on. Uh, another Mark in my life. I got my brother, Mark. Uh, interview quite a few Marks. <laughs> Mark Graven is awesome. So it's coming right up after this. All right. Thanks for coming on the Civil Engineering Academy podcast with me, Mark. How's it going? I'm good, Isaac. Thanks for having me here. I really appreciate you jumping on. I was, uh, you know, we, I know you do a podcast called My Favorite Mistake, and mm -hmm. that really excited me to talk about that with you. Um, you know, the audience that I talk to is civil engineers, and a lot of them, you know, I, I fall in this category too, but we make mistakes, we fail, we fail exams, and we we want to get ourselves back up and, and keep moving forward. So I guess before we jump into things, it would be nice um, if, if, you could tell us a little bit more about your background and how you found yourself going from like engineering into a public speaking role and coaching and entrepreneurship. How did, how did that happen? Yeah. Tell us about your background. Well, so, so some of that certainly evolved over time and I, I can share you how I stumbled into some of that. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of your audience or most of your audience is civil engineers. I'm an industrial engineer. Okay. I have a bachelor's in industrial engineering from Northwestern University, just outside of Chicago. I started my career uh, in my hometown of Livonia, Michigan at General Motors, working as an IE out on the shop floor. And I had the chance to go get a master's program at MIT. It was a dual master's in mechanical engineering and an MBA. Wow. Went to work for Dell Computer. And then moving ahead a few steps, I, I thought I wanted this career in manufacturing leadership. Big company um, settings is, I guess, what I had exposure to. At MIT, I got some exposure to the world of entrepreneurship, which was really eye-opening. And um, I can kind of understand why, generally speaking, entrepreneurs come from families where there are entrepreneurs. It's not so much that it's in your right. blood, but you're exposed to it. Um, so I was working in manufacturing careers or a, my manufacturing career. And then about 10 years into it, you know, I was doing training. So I was doing what you might call internal speaking. Okay. Not really public speaking. But then I had an opportunity in 2005 because my wife took a new job. We moved to Texas that put me on the job market. I was able to get my first job working as a healthcare consultant. Hmm. So I was hired by a division of Johnson & Johnson that did consulting um, with healthcare organizations. And so in that role, I was thrown into doing more public presentations and public speaking. Um, I had started podcasting 
you know, um, in 2006, I I'd started blogging the year before. So even before social media really became a thing, I guess I, you know, I was starting to get more comfortable with putting myself out there more publicly and sharing lessons learned and commenting on things in the news and trying to share experiences about lean manufacturing or lean in healthcare. And then I had the opportunity to write my first book, Lean Hospitals. And then here, you know, here's the funny thing. When you uh, get a book written and published, then you get more opportunities to come speak. Mm. I'm like, you've got to be careful with the assumption that, you know, what it takes to get a book into print, that's a different skill set or maybe even a different personality than what it takes to get up on stage and, I um, can and imagine. talk about it. But um, I've tried to develop my skills in, in both those areas. Um, for anyone else in the audience that would consider themselves, um, if, if you've done the Myers-Briggs test at work, I am mm -hmm. very heavily a Myers-Briggs introvert. Wow. But I want to try to give encouragement you know, to, to, to the introverts out there. Um, you can do things that are public if you're comfortable with it. You can be on stage. You might seem like you're an extrovert, but then there's the trap. Like it says, the, the thing about being an introvert is you can do it, but it's exhausting. Yes. And I've come to realize that um, better. Like last week, I had a, a day where I taught, I did a 30 minute online talk and a two plus hour online workshop. And I was exhausted. And wow. I think doing, doing that stuff virtually, I think is, um, is even harder. So, um, but back to your question, you know, I, I, I worked for a startup software company in the early 2000s. Um, I've been involved in another software company. I'll hold up my coffee mug, uh, a company, Kinexus. Mm. Uh, June is my 10th anniversary of um, having different roles with that company. So I, I've been fortunate that I've shifted from kind of you know, full-time traditional W-2 employment to uh, having my own company for 10 plus years, um, often partnering up through other companies or consulting firms to do bigger things, um, being involved in entrepreneurship of helping grow Kinexus. And, and frankly, I couldn't do all that if my wife didn't have um, a really great career. Uh, <laughs> and, and that sort of stability and health insurance that allows me um, to do things that are entrepreneurial. That's great. So with the new company that you have, are you helping other companies then uh, with, with Lean? Is that mainly the focus there? Yeah, so when I started okay. working independently back in 2010, yeah, I, I, I do speaking, training, consulting, coaching. You know, there are some things that I can do um, individually and I can contract directly um, with organizations, mostly in healthcare, sometimes in other industries. But then there are times where, you know, for example, the last three and a half years, I've also been a subcontractor to a larger firm called Value Capture, which okay. is uh, a, a consulting firm that is totally focused on healthcare using lean methodologies and related ideas to really um, drive a focus on employee safety and patient safety in a way that, that helps drive other benefits through the organization. So That's again, like I get to juggle different things. I, I wear different hats. I mean, they're proverbial hats, but I get to do a lot of different things sometimes in the same day. That's awesome. Well, one of the ways we connected, one of the things I really enjoy what you're doing is you started a podcast called My Favorite Mistake. Um, tell me how that started and maybe why, why are we so afraid to make mistakes? Well, I think to the question of, you know, I think to, to the last part of the question, and then, then we, we can maybe explore, there were a couple of different paths that came together to lead to my favorite mistake. I would, I would be the first to admit that, um, you know, like a lot of people, I've got uh, perfectionist tendencies. I think I've always been the type who I'm, I'm harder on myself than others might be on me, my parents or mm -hmm. um, co-workers or a manager. Um, so some of that may be just personality trait. But I think whether we are hard on ourselves or not, when we make a mistake, then there are oftentimes organizational dynamics that do criticize, uh, punish um, mistake making. 
And you know, there, there are, there's a time and a place to be cautious. Like I would hope a professional engineer who is designing um, a building or a bridge or, or something like that, um, you don't wanna be of the mindset in Silicon Valley that often applies to software development of fail fast, fail early, fail often. <laughs> we, there's a time and a place where failure is bad, of course. That's true in healthcare. But mm -hmm. I think the idea of fail early comes back to a lesson I've learned and, and the coaching I've gotten from former Toyota people I've worked with. When we fail early, meaning if we're going to make a mistake, do it, make a mistake during um, a prototype phase, during testing, um, during a, a practice session, like those are relatively safe mistakes that might not affect the customer, that might not be publicly embarrassing. Um, so I think, you know, the, 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 the Toyota production system or the lean approach teaches us um, when we make small mistakes and we can be honest about them, that helps us prevent large, major, really bad mistakes. So uh, from an organizational culture standpoint, you know, we don't want leaders to proverbially beat people up for trying something new and, 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 and have that new experiment not work out the way we expect. Sure. Um, if it's a, if it's a mistake, you know, there, there are a couple different types of mistakes. There's like, we, we didn't know what to do and we tried our best and it didn't work out the way we predicted and we learned from it. Sometimes that's a type of mistake. Then there are mistakes when we knew what to do, but we didn't do it for some mm. reason. And you know, we, we, we should, I think as leaders, try to create an environment. We've tried to do this in Kinexus as a, a software company, create hmm. an environment where individuals are not blamed and shamed for well-intended mistakes or human error. We try to look at, at the system and um, how can we prevent mistakes? So again, there are helpful ideas from lean manufacturing and the Toyota production system of how do we design sense. a system that's robust? Let's not be at the mercy of human error because we're all human, we all make mistakes, and, and that, that's, that's part of the theme that comes into the podcast. If, if you want me to tell maybe the story about how the podcast came to be. Yeah, I, I'm just, you can touch on it. I'm just curious, you know, was there a mistake that you made that drove that podcast? Because I, I love the, the title and, um, you know, just, you know, for, for a civil engineering audience, a lot of engineers are, uh, find themselves either repeating exams that they have to take to become professional engineers, or they do make mistakes on jobs. I've made mistakes on, on jobs that I've designed, you know, and you, you know, <laughs> you quick, you quickly learn from those. So I, right. it would be nice to know, you know, if there was a mistake that you made that drove this podcast or did you just know that people make mistakes and this would be a fun topic to talk, talk about? Um, well, I mean, I, I make mistakes all the time, but there's a difference between, you know, my most recent mistake and my favorite mistake. Um, <laughs> I think part of the origin that led to the podcast, one mistake that has stuck with me and I've come to describe this as a favorite mistake. Like it's, it's a mistake that's big enough that it stays with you you think about it, you're, you've learned from it. The goal is to, you know, to be open about mistakes and to reflect on them and learn from them and not make the same mistakes over and over. Right. So there's a story that I shared uh, in, I, so I, I, I spearheaded a book project called Practicing Lean, where I wrote the first two chapters and then I invited other people and I ended up with um, 15 other authors who wrote an essay or a chapter Kind of along the theme and the theme that i set up in the book was in in the idea of practicing lean you know i've worked in healthcare and people talk about practicing medicine and, and that's a good word right it implies hopefully that you're getting better over mm -hmm. time we practice because we're not perfect and um you know so so i i i wrote the the, the this book and the one story I, sh I shared was in my last manufacturing job um I was going through a certification process to be basically a lean black belt and that required a project. And, you know, part of it was the organizational culture, 
where it wasn't a culture that really allowed me um, to shut down production for any period of time to work with the frontline operators. And so for the things that I was putting in place to improve the process, it was really hard to get input from some of those key frontline staff because they were busy. I would try to catch them yeah. when there was some sort of downtime, but unplanned downtime. And so long story short, I ended up designing some process improvements, some, some solutions related to scheduling and uh, changeovers and Kanban inventory levels. It was all technically correct, but mm -hmm. I think when, I mean, it was never really fully adopted. And so the lesson learned there was, you know, partly, you know, to take ownership of my own action. Could I, should I have tried harder to get input from the frontline staff? Should I have ma made more of a fuss to leadership saying, look, you, for this to be successful and sustainable, you've got to give me that time. Um, but I've carried that lesson forward to now where I can think as a consultant, I don't want to allow myself to be put in that position again. I can mm -hmm. turn down a consulting gig if somebody says, well, we want you to come in and design the answer and just hand it off to us and leave. I'm like, well, why? I don't, I don't agree with the hypothesis that that would be successful. So the book Practicing Lean you know, got me thinking along these lines of we all make mistakes, especially early in our careers. Let's learn from them. Let's share them. I think that sets a good example for others. Yeah. And then um, that led to the idea pandemic project of doing the podcast, My Favorite Mistake. And, and, and the other dimension of it was that I would get pitched, you know, I've been doing a podcast about lean manufacturing for 15 years. And I would get pitched these guests that sounded really interesting. And I would have to say no, because it wasn't a fit. And I, I, I kind of came around to think that that was a mistake that I needed to create a way to say yes. So I had been pitched the opportunity to interview uh, Kevin Harrington, who was one of the original sharks on the show Shark Tank. Wow. And so instead of saying, no, I'm sorry, he's not a fit with my lean podcast, part of the reason for creating my favorite mistake was to be able to say yes to interesting people um, that I was looking to interview and get to meet and get to know. And That's perfect. So think, you know, that, that, that's been a really fun project because I've been able to interview people who've shared mistakes from um, the standpoint of um, you know, uh, telemarketing TV sales like Kevin Harrington did. I've had um, former NFL and NHL players kind of talking about the world of sports. I've had uh, a musician, I've had entrepreneurs, I've had um, you know, people from different fields who've just shared their own favorite mistakes story. And then we end up talking about, again, this idea of uh, being aware of mistakes, being kind to ourselves and others when there are mistakes, and then learn from them, get better, keep moving on. Perfect. Well, um, you know, and that goes along with, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of our civil engineers either find themselves making a mistake at work or they're failing their exams, even if they repeat it. And a lot of these uh, engineers are taking that personally, mm -hmm. um, thinking that they you know, can't be an engineer or that they, you know, they suck at being an engineer and maybe this isn't the right career path for them. But uh, I consistently tell them that it's not a reflection of them personally and you can still do this after you, you just need to learn the process and practice and, you know, learn from where you made the initial mistake and see if we can improve on that. Yeah. And so I, I imagine that's a common theme no matter what uh, profession or industry um, that, that you find yourself in. Is that kind of, is that what you've noticed as you've been interviewing guests or yeah. uh, is there a, a recipe when people make mistakes and try yeah, to learn from them? It's funny, I mean, I'm trying to, uh, I'm to the point now where I'm starting to look for patterns mm -hmm. and sort of mining the different inter interviews and kind of cat my engineer brain wants to categorize things yes. and connect dots. Um, but like when it comes to the tests, like just a question back for you, Isaac, like what, what's the first time pass rate for the professional there, engineering exam? There, so your first time pass rates typically for the PE exam is hovering around 70 percent. OK. But as a repeat taker, it really nosedives to about 40 percent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's some thoughts around that. Usually your first time taking it, you're giving it your best shot. You're also getting uh, 
maybe the brightest minds trying to pass that the very first time. So, but yeah, th those are the statistics. So about 70, mm -hmm. 65 to 70% your first time, if you're a repeat taker, that thing dives to 35 to 40%. Sure. So, I mean, I, you mentioned the word why Isaac. So, I mean, I think when having a setback like this, any sort of professional setback, I don't think it's fair to say, hey, don't be upset about that because we're human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Engineers have emotion too, right? Got to um, vent. So you've got to get through, you know, if you will, that maybe there are stages of grief. Um, and then when you get yourself back to a place where you can step back and now try to be analytical and try to understand, to ask the question why. There may not be a single root cause for why we didn't pass the exam, but it, I imagine it could be a number of things. It could be, I was overconfident and I didn't study hard enough. Mm -hmm. like maybe that's addressable then. Um, maybe, you know, the, the, let's say maybe there were extenuating circumstances in your life and you were distracted and not in a place where you could really focus and prepare or be focused on the day of the exam. So there, there, there might be a number of factors involved. And, and so I guess I would just invite people to try to reflect and think back on, can we identify what we might do differently the second time around, um, rather than just trying the same approach over right. and over again? That makes if sense. That's the thought process I would explore if I was trying to help coach somebody through that. Yeah. And a lot of times I, I've noticed that engineers, they get when they do get frustrated, you have an option to uh, take a different depth exam. So a lot of people will get frustrated because they feel like they failed that first time or maybe even a second time and they want to completely change it up. Um, a new exam, a new everything. And I and I do understand that, but I, I have to rein them in a little bit and say, well, look, um, you know, you've taken this exam before and you've learned how they ask the questions, what's on the exam. Uh, I probably wouldn't rock the boat too much. And, you know, let's find out what you can fix in the areas that you've, you already know, and then sure. go from there. So, yeah, that's, that's true. Great. It might not take a radically different approach. Um, yeah, I don't know what sort of, um, you know, representative practice exams are available where, you know, at some point, you know, are there lessons learned that the first time exam taker can learn from? You're not going to know exactly what the test is, of course, but are there ways to practice um, to sort of simulate the experience? I mean, I think back to any standardized test out there. Mm -hmm. That's the reference point I have. Um, or, at one point, I had a professional certification called CPIM, Certified in Production and Inventory Management. And that was a you know, study, standardized test, computer, proctored exam kind of environment. And I, and I passed that. Um, but yeah, at first, it's, it's uncomfortable if you don't really know what to expect. I think having some sort of practice environment maybe eliminates some of those first time That'd test be great. fail situations i don't know yeah i think that's great advice um uh, one of the things i noticed that you have also written is a book called measures measure uh, measures of success um tell us a little bit about that as a resource to these yeah. these engineers there it is hold on let me got a, got a copy handy i didn't have a copy practicing lean is back on the shelf somewhere but i i talk about measures of success more so i have a copy Andy. Tell us a little um, bit about that. And, and, um, you know, I, I want, I think you've shared a ton of information about mistake making, and I think everybody should go check out your podcast as well, but tell us a little bit about this book measures of success. Yeah. So it's a book that, um, it's been out about two years. It's the first book that I wrote that wasn't framed as a healthcare management book. So my first mm -hmm. book, well, Practicing Lean was not a healthcare book, but that was a different type of project. My first book, uh, Lean Hospitals, and then a book that I co-authored with another engineer, Joe Schwartz, a book called Healthcare Kaizen. Like those were clearly targeted to a healthcare audience. With um, the book Measures of Success, I wanted to challenge myself to write something 
that would have broader appeal to leaders in different industries. Because I thought the lessons that I'm sharing in the book are applicable, I've seen them be applicable in manufacturing, startups, healthcare settings. And so Measures of Success is meant to be an introductory book. Um, engineers listening might be familiar um, with an approach called statistical process control. It's often called control charts. Well, Measures of Success teaches a methodology that I learned 25 years ago. Um, it's it's a, a form of control chart. Uh, it's an XMR chart for those who are more t uh, technically, statistically minded. But mm -hmm. um, they're often also referred to, I like the phrase, process behavior charts. And so if we look at any metrics that we are tracking, monitoring, reacting to in an organization, process behavior charts help us learn how to stop overreacting to every up and down in a metric or every data point that's worse than average. So, um, we, we can use these statistical process control rules and the visual nature of these charts to help us understand when we have basically what, what we can call just noise in a metric, don't react to that noise. But then when we detect statistical signals using some basic control chart rules, that's a time for leadership to then uh, ask questions like what changed, what happened, what do we learn from that, what's the root cause? And you know, as the subtitle of the book says, um, react less, lead better, improve more. Like I've just seen organizations of all kinds have leaders just wasting so much time reacting to every up and down in the yeah. metrics. They ask people to go investigate, that wastes a lot of time. That distracts us and consumes time that could be better focused in, in a agree. way that allows us, again, to improve more. So that's that's what the book is uh, about. Even though it uses some statistical methods, I've gotten feedback from people that it's very approachable, it's very readable. Um, it's, a, I think, a, a good practical guide. Show us the topic. cover of that book again. There and it is, Measures see, of Success. Got a little roller coaster. Right, so that, that represents the idea of um, the current state. We're mm -hmm. trying to help get off of that roller coaster. And it, you know, that's a civil engineer is going to cringe. Like the way that's drawn <laughs> is very stylistic. Like I think that yeah, car is about to crash as opposed to flipping back up. But, Shooting. you know, kind of we talk about this proverbial metrics roller coaster. Of like, let's let's you know, we've got these highs and lows and we get excited and then we get scared and nervous. And, and let's try to stop that dynamic and, and do something more constructive. That's great. I come from the utility industry and it was very similar to that. You know, a mistake was made and everyone would be all over it trying to figure out what's going on. But it just consumed uh, resources and people's times. And um, we even went through the, the lean uh, uh, method. And, you know, you, ha you have to take time to do that um, pur purposefully. And mm -hmm. so you, you, you have to schedule people's time and everyone's busy and sit down and really hammer out where you're sitting at right now and where we can find improvements. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think that's a great book. Everyone go check that out. Uh, also go check nice. out the podcast, My Favorite Mistake. Mark, I really appreciate you jumping on with me today. Is there a, a sure. good way for our audience to get a hold of you and reach out to you if they had any questions? Yeah, so uh, people can find me, uh, my website, markgraben.com. Uh, if people want to check out the podcast, you can just search My Favorite Mistake in any of the podcast directories, or you can go to myfavoritemistakepodcast.com, mm -hmm. and that forwards to a page on my markgraven.com uh, website. Uh, the book they can find, you can go to measuresofsuccessbook.com, and I I'm pretty easy to find online. My name's unique enough if you spell it right, G-R-A-B-A-N. <laughs> You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you, you can message me there. Like, I, 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 well, Here's one of my mistakes. I learned at some point, I, I had no idea that there was messaging in Instagram. Oh, I don't yeah. use Instagram real heavily. And I realized at some point like, oh, what's this icon do? And I tapped on it and I had a couple of messages and like one of them was actually like kind of like business related. And I'm like, oh. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, don't don't try to contact me through Instagram message. That's like, I guess my advice. But my lesson learned is to learn how these apps work and um, at least occasionally check for messages. Excellent. Well, Mark, I appreciate you jumping on today. Uh, 
I, I've loved your message. I love the podcast. I think you got good stuff going on. So I uh, really do appreciate it. And maybe we'll see you in the future. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me again. See ya. Thank you.